Thoughts on the Revival of Religion in Northampton, 1740. Chapter 13. Reasons for believing that the great work of God for the world's conversion may begin in America. It is not unlikely that this work of God's Spirit, which is so extraordinary and wonderful, is the dawning, or at least a prelude of that glorious work of God, so often foretold in Scripture, which in the process and issue of it shall renew the world of mankind. If we consider how long since the things foretold as what should precede this great event have been accomplished, and how long this event has been expected by the Church of God, and thought to be nigh by the most eminent men of God in the Church, and with all consider the state of things now is, and has for a considerable time been, in the Church of God, in the world of mankind, we cannot reasonably think otherwise that the beginning of this great work of God must be near. And there are many things that make it probable that this work will begin in America. It is signified that it shall begin in some very remote part of the world, that the rest of the world have no communication with by, but by navigation. In Isaiah chapter 60, verse 9, Surely the isles wait, will wait for me and the ships of Tarsus first to bring my sons from far. It is exceeding manifest that this chapter is a prophecy of the prosperity of the church in its most glorious state on earth in the latter days. And I cannot think that anything else can be here intended but America, by the isles that are far off, from whence the firstborn sons of that glorious day shall be brought, indeed, by the isles. In prophecies of glory, gospel times, it is very often meant Europe. It is so in prophecies of that great spreading of the gospel that shall soon be after Christ's time, because it was far separated from that part of the world where the church of God had until then been by the sea. But this prophecy cannot have respect to the conversion of Europe in the time of that great work of God in the primitive ages of the Christian church. For it was not fulfilled then. The isles and ships of Tarsus thus understood did not wait for God first. That glorious work did not begin in Europe, but in Jerusalem, and had for a considerable time been very wonderfully carried on in Asia before it reached Europe. And as it is not that work of God that is chiefly intended in this chapter, but that more glorious work that should be in the latter ages of the Christian church, therefore some other part of the world is here intended by the isles that should be as Europe then was, far separated from that part of the world where the church had been before by the sea, and which, with which it can have no communication but by the ships of Tarsus. What is chiefly intended is not the British Isles, nor any isles near that other continent, for they are spoken of as at a great distance from the, that part of the world where the church had been till then been. This prophecy, therefore, seems plainly to point out America as the first fruits of that glorious day. God has made, as it were, two worlds here below, the old and the new, according to the names that are now called by. Two great habit, uh, habitable continents, far separated one from the other. The latter is, but newly discovered, it was formerly uh, wholly unknown from age to age, and is as it were now, but newly created. It has been, until of late, wholly the possession of Satan, the Church of God, having never been in it as it has been in the other continent from the beginning of the world. This new world is probably now discovered that the new and the most glorious state of God's church on earth might commence there, that God might in it begin a new world in a spiritual respect when he creates the new heavens and the new earth. God has already put that honor upon the other continent that Christ was born there literally, and there made the purchase of redemption, so as providence obscures a kind of equal distribution of things, it is not unlikely that the great spiritual birth of Christ and the most glorious application of redemption is to begin in this, as the elder sister brought forth Judah, of whom came Christ, and so she was the mother of Christ, but the younger sister, after long barrenness, brought forth Joseph and Benjamin, the beloved children. Joseph that had the most glorious pearl, the coat of many colors, who was separated from his brother, and was exalted to such glory out of a dark dungeon, and fed and saved the world when ready to perish with fame and famine. 
and was as a fruitful bulb that a well, whose branches ran over the wall, and was blessed with all manner of blessings and precious things of heaven and earth, through the good will of him that dwelt in the bush, and was by as by the horns of a unicorn, to push the people together to the ends of the earth, as an example, conquer the world. See Genesis 49, uh, verse 22, etc., and Deuteronomy chapter 33, uh, verse 13, etc., and Benjamin, whose mess was five times so great as that of any of his brethren, and to whom Joseph, the type of Christ, gave wealth and raiment far beyond all the rest. Genesis 45, verse 22. The other continent uh, hath slain Christ, and has from age to age shed the blood of the saints and martyrs of Jesus, and has often been, as it were, deluged with the church's blood. God has therefore probably reserved the honor of building the glorious temple to the daughter that has not shed so much blood, when those times of the peace and prosperity and glory of the church shall commence, that were typified by the reign of Solomon. The Gentiles first received the true religion from the Jews, God's church of ancient times had been among them, and Christ was of them. But that there might be a kind of equity in the dispensations of providence. God has so ordered it that when the Jews come to be admitted to the benefits of the evangelical dispensations and to receive their highest privileges of all, they should receive the gospel from the Gentiles. Though Christ was of them, yet they had been guilty of crucifying him. It is therefore the will of God that the people should not have the honor of communicating the blessings of the kingdom of God in its most glorious state to the Gentiles, but on the contrary, they shall receive the gospel in the beginning of that glorious day from the Gentiles. In some analogy as this, I apprehend God's dealings with and will be with the two continents. America has received the true religion of the old continent. The church of ancient times has been there, and Christ is from thence, but that there may be uh, an equity. And inasmuch as that continent have crucified Christ, they shall not have the honor of communicating religion in its most glorious state to us, but we to them. The old continent has been the source and origin of mankind in several respects. The first parents of mankind dwelt there, and there dwelt Noah and his sons. And there the son, second Adam was born, and was crucified and rose again. And it is probable that in some measure to balance these things, the most glorious renovation of the world shall originate from the new continent, and the church of God in that respect be from hence. And so it is probable that that will come to pass in spirituals that has in temporals with respect to America that, whereas till of late the world was supplied with its silver and gold and earthen treasures from the old continent, and now is supplied chiefly from the new. So the course of things in spiritual respects will be, in like manner, turned. And it is worthy to be noted that the America was discovered about the time of the Reformation, or but little before, which Reformation was the first thing that God did towards the glorious renovation of the world after it had sunk into the depths of darkness and woe into the great anti-Christian apostasy. So that as soon as this new world is, as it were, created and stands forth in view, God presently goes about doing some great thing to make way for the induction of the church's later day glory, that is to have its first seat in, and is to take its rise from that new world. It is agreeable to God's manner of working when he accomplishes any glorious work in the world to introduce a new and more excellent state of his church, to begin his work where his church had not been till then, and where it was no foundation already laid, that the power of God might be the more conspicuous, that the work might appear to be entirely God's, and be more manifestly a creation of nothing, agreeably to Hosea 1.10. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. When God is about to turn the earth into a paradise, he does not begin his work, where there is some good growth already, but in the big wilderness, where nothing grows and nothing is to be seen but dry sand and barren rocks that the light may shine out of darkness and the world be replenished from emptiness and the earth water by springs from a treasury desert, agreeably to many prophecies of scriptures in Isaiah 32, 15, until the Spirit be poured from on high and the wilderness become 
a fruitful field. In chapter 41, verse 18, I will open rivers in high places and fountains in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. I will plant in the wilderness of cedar, the scented tree and the myrtle and oil tree. I will set in the desert the fir tree and the pine and the box tree together. In chapter 43, verse 20, I will give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. I give drink to my people, my chosen. Many other parallel scriptures might be mentioned. I observed before that when God is about to do something, some great work for his church, his manner is to begin at the lower end, so when he is about to renew the whole habitable earth, it is probable that he will begin in this utmost, meanest, youngest, and meekest part of it, where the church of God has been planted last of all. And so the first shall be last, and the last first, and that will be fulfilled. In an eminent manner in Isaiah 24, verse 16. From the utmost part of the earth have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous. There are several things that seem to me to argue that when the Son of Righteousness, the Son of the new heaven and new earth, comes to rise and comes forth as the bridegroom of his church, rejoicing as a strong man to run his race, having his going forth from the end of heaven and a circuit to the end of it, that nothing shall be hid from the light and heat of it. The sun shall rise in the west, contrary to the course of this world, or the course of things in the old heaven and earth. The course of God's providence shall in that day be so wonderfully altered in many respects that God will, as it were, change the course of nature in answer to the prayers of the church, as God changed the course of nature and caused the sun to go from the west to the east when Hezekiah was healed. And God promised to do so. Such great things for his church as to deliver it out of the hand of the king of Assyria by that mighty slaughter by the angel, which is often used by the prophet Isaiah as a type of the glorious deliverance of the church when her enemies in the latter days, the resurrection of Hezekiah, the king and captain of the church, as he is called, Second Kings 20.15, as it were from the dead, is given as an earnest of the church resurrection and salvation, Isaiah 38, uh, verse 6. And, footnote, it is evident that the Holy Spirit in these expressions, Psalms 19, 4, 5, and 6, has respect to something else besides that natural sun, and that an eye it is had to the sun of righteousness, that by his light converts the soul, makes wise the simple, enlightens the eyes, and rejoices the heart, and by his preached gospel enlightens and warms the world of mankind, touches the psalms own application in verse 7, and the Apostles' application of verse 4, in Romans 10, verse 18. End of the footnote. Is a type of the resurrection of Christ. At the same time, there is a resurrection of the Son, who are coming back and rising again from the west, whether it had gone down, which is also a type of the Son of Righteousness. The Son was brought back 10 degrees, which probably brought it to the meridian. The Son of Righteousness has long been going down from east to west, and probably when the time comes of the church's deliverance from her enemies, so often typified by the Assyrians, the light will rise in the west until it shines to the world like the sun in its meridian brightness. The same seems also to be represented by the course of the waters of the sanctuaries, Ezekiel chapter 47, which was from west to east, which waters undoubtedly represent the Holy Spirit in the progress of his saving influences in the latter ages of the world, for it is manifest that the whole of those last chapters of Ezekiel are concerning the glorious state of the church that shall then be. And if we may suppose that this glorious work of God may begin in any part of America, I think if we consider the circumstances of the settlement of New England, it must needs appear the most likely of all the American colonies to be the place whence this work shall principally take its rise. And if these things are so, it gives more abundant reason to hope that what is now seen in America, and especially in New England, may prove the dawn of the glorious day of the very uncommon and wonderful circumstances and events of this work seems to me strongly to argue that God intends it as the beginning of the forerunner of something vastly great. I have thus long insisted on this point, because if these things are so, it greatly manifests how much it behooves us to encourage and promote this work, and how dangerous it will be to forbear so to do. End of chapter 13.